Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for watching this short video. I'm doing this video for a couple of reasons. One, I want to let you know about a longer video that I'm working on right now. And Lord willing, it will be coming out probably tomorrow, April the 8th. If not tomorrow, certainly by April the 9th will be coming out. And um, it is dealing with how the coronavirus, COVID-19, has just utterly laid bare the absolute bankruptcy of the word faith movement, new apostolic reformation, all these so-called uh, prophets, charismatic prophets. And, and uh, I deal, I'm going to deal with a lot of people in this video coming up. Kenneth Copeland, of course, he's kind of made a lot of uh, waves in the, even in the secular media with his outlandish statements. But and we're going to talk about Kenneth Copeland, but we're going to talk about a number of others as well. We're going to talk about Andrew Womack, and we're going to talk about Sean Bowles, and we're going to talk about Bill Johnson and uh, Heidi Baker and uh, Chuck Pierce and Tracy Cook and uh, some of these, even uh, Chuck Pierce and Tracy Cook that Michael Brown says his, uh, he thinks may have prop, uh, accurately prophesied about the coronavirus. Well, we're going to see that no, they didn't. Uh, so anyway, it's it's going to be a pretty hard-hitting video and a lot of information in it. So I want to let you know about that. Be on the lookout for it. And once it drops or is posted either tomorrow or the next day, Lord willing, uh, be, uh, be sure to tell your friends and family members, especially those who may be involved in this movement to one degree or another, because I, I think if they'll watch this, that uh, they will see just how th this this COVID-19 thing has just uh, exposed this movement for the farce that it really is, irrefutably so. And so uh, if, I think if they'll watch that uh, video that's coming out um, with, a, with a fair open mind, I think that it, it may really help open their eyes to the deception. So that's one reason I'm doing this video, let you know what's coming up. But also, I want to take this opportunity to address one of the more common criticisms that comes my way in doing what I do. As I read through the comments on some of the videos I put up on my YouTube channel and emails that I get, uh, the vast majority of them, by the way, are very encouraging, very positive. But but I get, as you might imagine, I get uh, my fair share of criticism and angry emails, angry phone calls. I got a really angry phone call yesterday from some guy. But uh, one of the common criticisms that I hear is, oh, well, all you do is tear people down. You just make a name for yourself by tearing others down. And that's all Justin Peters does is criticize other people. I want to address that for a minute. Um, number one, even though I'm most well known for my work in Word of Faith, NAR, combating those false movements, uh, refuting them biblically, it's kind of what I'm known for. It's not at all my only interest. Uh, my first love is exposition, doing expository preaching. I really love to do that. Um, there's a number of other issues that I've also studied and have interest in. So uh, it, this is by no means all I do. I mean, people think that all I do is sit around and watch TBN all day. I, I can assure you that I don't. Um, but because of the nature of my seminar, Clouds Without Water, it is rather unique. And so most of the invitations that I get to go and preach and teach uh, are in relation to this issue. That's what most people want me to come and, and help them to help them and their churches to um, more rightly understand. So it's kind of what I'm known for, but it's not at all my only interest. But I also want to talk about uh, some of the pitfalls with doing this kind of work, with doing discernment in general. Now, there's there's two different ditches when it comes to biblical discernment, exercising discernment. There's the one ditch in which people just don't think it's necessary. They think you don't have to talk about the false teachers and, you know, God will take care of them. If they're wrong, God will take care of them. Don't worry about it. Kind of a, uh, Gamaliel's advice in Acts chapter 5 that I deal with in my seminar, actually. Uh, th this kind of Pollyannish view, oh, it's no big deal, you know, don't worry about it. Just, just talk about the truth and, and don't worry about the, the false teachers, questionable guys. So that's one ditch. Uh, the other ditch is that you fixate on it, and that's all that you do. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in Jude verses 2 through 3. I want us to look at that. Jude verses 2 through 3. Next to the last book in the New Testament, Jude writes, he says, Beloved, 
While I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into, of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I really tried to make Jude 2 through 3 my guiding text in doing this aspect of my ministry, the clouds without water, engaging the false teachers. Notice that Jude writes, in, the, in what he says right out of the gate, after he gives a greeting in verse 1, but, uh, verse 1 and 2, but then he says, Beloved brothers, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. In other words, Jude was saying, Brothers, I would love nothing more than to write to you about our common salvation. I would love nothing more than to write to you about the gospel. That's what I want to do. But I found it necessary to write to you, to exhort you, to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered unto the saints. Why? Because certain men have crept in unnoticed, unawares. Um, they've crept in secretly. And so even though Jude's heartbeat was to preach about the gospel, talk about our common salvation, he found it necessary to warn them about false teachers. Warning people about false teachers is a command in Scripture. In fact, you might find this interesting, 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament directly warn about false teachers and or false teaching. 26 of the 27 books. Only, only the book of Philemon has nothing to say at all about false doctrine and or false teachers. Every other book in the New Testament does. So warning people about false doctrine and false teachers is a prominent theme in the New Testament. All of the apostles did it. Jesus himself did it repeatedly. So this is a command in Scripture. We must do it. And yet... Even though it is a command, it's something that we must do, it should be a task that grieves us that it is necessary to do in the first place. Jude did it because he had to, but it's not what he wanted to do. His, his heartbeat, his first desire was just to write about our common salvation. That's what he wanted to do, but it was necessary to do this other I think I can honestly tell you, dear ones, that I would love nothing more than to wake up tomorrow morning and see where all of these false teachers have repented, either repented or their ministries come to an end. Uh, preferably repented. I would love to see that. I would love to see where Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and Todd White and uh, Chuck Pierce and Bill Johnson and all these, all these others, all these other false teachers and wolves have repented. The evidence that they have truly repented would, that they would, would be that they would shut their own ministries down because if they truly were in a place of genuine repentance, they would understand that they're not qualified to be teachers, uh, Bible preachers. So they, they would shut their ministries down. That would be the evidence that they've repented. So I would love nothing more than to see that. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think that that's coming anytime soon. False teachers have been a problem in the church practically since day one, and they remain so today. And so um, there's these ditches. You think that it's just never necessary to talk about false teachers? That's one ditch. And the other one is you become too fixated with it. And, and if you ever get to the place where, and, and I see some people do this, uh, some people who really are into discernment, you know, and that's important to them, and that's that's good in and of itself. We should all exercise discernment. Uh, we should all examine everything through the lens of Scripture. But some people become so fixated on it that you almost get the sense that if if they were to, if there wasn't someone to go after, if there wasn't a false teacher to warn about, you almost get the sense that some people would be disappointed. If there wasn't somebody to go after, they would be disappointed. And friend, if you ever get to that place, 
If you ever get into that ditch, that's a dangerous place to be. Okay, don't ever get to the place where you relish in this, um, that, that, that you would be disappointed if there wasn't someone to critique. We do this because we're commanded to do it. And we, we do it because what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull God's sheep out away from the wolves. But, oh, how, how I wish it wasn't necessary to worry about the wolves. I wish that there were not any wolves, but the fact of the matter is, is that there are. So as Paul says in Titus chapter one, verse nine, teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So be very careful that you don't get in either one of those ditches. Make Jude verses two through three your guiding principle in the necessary and yet unfortunate work of discernment. Okay, I hope that this helps you today. And so know that that is my heart. Know that that is my heart as we go into uh, this next video that I'm working on and will be coming out, Lord willing, here shortly. Thank you so much. May God bless you.